management of pickleball injuries. And uh, that's me and just some generic x-rays. So a little, little bit about me. So I'm from the Philadelphia area. Um, I attended the University of Virginia for undergrad where I was on the basketball team um, and got my fair share of bumps and bruises from guys who were bigger, stronger, and faster. After that, I did some research at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, they get to be the same color blue as the background, so we won't talk too much about Penn. I was a med student at, at Temple and then uh, an orthopedic resident back at the University of Virginia, uh, where I got to you know work on all parts of the body um, and learn a ton about orthopedic surgery. Uh, I did my sports medicine fellowship at the Stedman Clinic in Vail, where I took care of athletes and got to enjoy the mountain. There's a picture with my wonderful wife wearing our Team USA gear. Um, and I've been at Rothman uh, for just a few months now. So I've really enjoyed it um, and uh, feel really lucky to get the chance to talk to everybody tonight about some pickleball injuries. So a brief outline. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about why uh, you should play pickleball, why you should enjoy it. There's a picture of me with my uh, my wonderful family there playing some pickleball on the Outer Banks. So I, I myself play some pickleball. We'll talk about some of the common injuries that uh, folks sustain, how we can prevent those injuries treatment options, should you get injured, and then I'm happy to answer questions at the end. So first of all, the benefits of exercise are pretty clear uh, in an era of, you know, post-pandemic, uh, aerobic exercise reduces the risk of severe disease and death from flu and pneumonia and the, the coronavirus. So there's just a graph there to, to give some, some hard evidence to show that the more you exercise each week, you know, as you get into about, uh, you know, two, three, four hours a week of aerobic activity that reduces your risk of having a bad outcome from any of the respiratory viruses or infections that we worry about. So exercise is clearly beneficial. Aerobic exercise, which you get from pickleball, helps to reduce the risk of developing many of the most common cancers, including breast and colon cancer. So being out there exercising has clear health benefits. There's a recent study published on the effect of running on people's mental health as compared to prescription antidepressant medications. And the basic takeaway was that aerobic exercise works as well or better than our most commonly prescribed antidepressants for both depression and anxiety. So getting out on the court and running around with some friends is clearly beneficial in a number of ways. So this is one of my favorite pickleball courts. Um, it's hard to see here, but I got to pass these guys a number of times when I was in Switzerland taking care of uh, the snowboard team, we were still at low enough altitude that there wasn't some, any snow yet, but these guys are setting up a pickleball court uh, that was set up by the time I left town. So you can play this all over the world, even enjoy it on vacation. The number one reason to play pickleball is that it's more fun than walking. So again, just a, a brief study here that playing doubles pickleball when you get to play with uh, some friends and maybe some enemies uh, induces more enjoyment. You burn more calories um, than going out for a walk. So certainly walking and running are great activities, but the social element of pickleball is undeniably a huge appeal and it's good for us. So now we'll get into this stuff that we're here to talk about tonight. So pickleball injuries. There's a study done by some of my colleagues here at the Rothman Institute looking at the most common upper extremity injuries in pickleball. It's a group of hand and shoulder surgeons. So the most common reason that people come to the ER and need treatment after pickleball when it comes to the upper extremity is a distal radius fracture, which is a fancy orthopedic way of saying that people break their wrists. So that x-ray on the right side of the screen there is a distal radius fracture. Um, this is most commonly because people either dive for a ball feeling exuberant or they trip and fall. So while this is a study of upper extremity injuries in pickleball, I think it drives home the point that balance and preparation are important before you get out on the court because we're all competitive. We all wanna win and beat our friends, our siblings, our children, our parents, um, but you need to work on getting your balance sort of woken up before you get out on the court so you don't end up with a broken wrist. Another common injury uh, that I've seen more than once in just the past two weeks is an injury to the Achilles or the calf because of fast acceleration in pickleball. So falls and fast acceleration, the two Fs, are sort of the enemy um, when you get out and play pickleball. Both of these, I think, we can work on before we get out on the court. The other thing that pickleball brings out are dormant injuries. So many times when people have been a little bit sedentary, you know, they've given up playing tennis maybe or basketball, whatever it is that you enjoy doing, uh, you know, maybe seven or eight years ago, you want to get back into pickleball because some friends are doing it. Some injuries that you're able to cope with during your daily life can come back to bite a little bit. So on the left side of the screen are some graphs that show the incidence of medial and lateral meniscus tears in asymptomatic 
folks. So people between the age of 30 and 65 who had no pain, you can see that about 20% of the folks had injuries to their medial meniscus, which if you're going to work, walking the dog, and just doing your regular activities of daily living might not cause you a problem. But when you get out and you put some pounding on your knees on the court, you may experience some symptoms. So meniscal injuries are certainly pretty common to flare up while you're playing pickleball. Other times it can be the shoulder. So that top MRI picture there on the right side of the screen is a rotator cuff tear. So again, rotator cuff tears are injuries that we can often manage with rest and activity modification and don't really flare up unless we're reaching to change a light bulb or get a coffee mug out of the highest shelf in the kitchen. But when you get out and play pickleball, sometimes those do flare up. Now the bottom x-rays are two representative examples up on the left side, primary arthritis of the shoulder. And on the right side of that lower image, what we call rotator cuff tear arthropathy or shoulder arthritis that's secondary to rotator cuff insufficiency. So if you're having shoulder pain after, a, you know, a few matches of pickleball, it could be that you flared up an old injury and haven't done anything new necessarily, but have really started to churn up the inflammation that you see uh, in those images. So the big way to prevent a lot of these injuries is with proper stretching and warm up. Now, this is a very sort of cliche depiction of a pickleball player, but this is from a website called Pickleball University, and I get uh, no benefit from promoting Pickleball University. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, interesting choice of, of name, but I think they do a really good job of outlining some of the best stretches uh, that you can do to prevent injury in pickleball. Now, I won't make you watch the video here, but I will emphasize that an appropriate warm up is important for preventing particularly injuries to the Achilles and the calf. Everyone wants to get out and play and have fun. Stretching can sometimes be uncomfortable or feel like a waste of time, but this is a five minute video that has about three minutes worth of stretching. And as the host emphasizes, everybody has three minutes. If you have 90 minutes set aside uh, for a match with friends, then you ought to have three minutes to warm up because an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. As much as we like doing surgery, we love when our friends and family members don't get hurt playing pickleball. So the big thing is to try to get the blood flowing a little bit, whether that's with a light jog or some jumping in place. It doesn't even have to be jumping jacks. Just trying to activate the muscles of the posterior aspect or the backside of your leg and try to get blood flow to the tendons and ligaments of the lower extremity is really important. It also helps to activate your balance so that you don't go from a 40-minute car ride right onto the court, trip and fall and break your wrist. It's a story that we've seen too many times in the ER and in our clinic. So getting a warm up for the lower extremity is important. It's also important to warm up both your dominant and non-dominant arms. And that can be done with really basic stretches, you know, wrist extension stretches, wrist flexion stretches that she goes over in this video. So please, I would uh, encourage you to watch this video and I shouldn't take too much credit for it because Pickleball University uh, put it together. And I'm happy to talk about other stretches or things we can do uh, afterwards here. So it's gonna try to play for us. And as you can see, I got three minutes and 50 seconds in. So we'll go to the next slide. All right, so injury management. If you come into our office with knee pain and swelling, we'll get an x-ray. And oftentimes people will say, you know, I don't have arthritis. It feels like my meniscus or my friend told me it's a meniscus. Why do we need x-rays? Well, x-rays can tell us a lot about what your injury is and a lot about what it's not. Um, so the x-ray gives us a good baseline of what's going on in your knee that's bothering you as compared to your healthy knee. Most of the diagnosis that you're going to get in an orthopedic surgeon's office or a sports medicine doctor who doesn't operate uh, will be by the examination. So x-ray, exam, and history will tell us a lot about what the injury is. And an MRI can be useful, but not always. So if you come to the office and you don't get an MRI, it's not because we don't care about you. We don't want to know the answer. It's because the x-rays in the exam can often be hugely uh, sort of impactful in our diagnosis and the MRI is used to confirm or to plan for surgery if we think that's necessary. So the things that are really important to me as the treating physician and surgeon are whether you had swelling after you had pain while you were playing pickleball. Did this swelling come about immediately after the injury or has it been going on on and off for weeks or months? Do you have mechanical symptoms? So if you were playing and had an acute episode of pain and then difficulty with moving your knee through a range of motion, like your knee gets locked or stuck at a particular posture, 
that's a mechanical symptom. If you can feel clicking that is painful, that's a mechanical symptom. So those are really important because they can often tell us that you have a displaced injury of a meniscus, the padding in the joint or the cartilage, the smooth bearing surface of the joint. The other thing we'll want to know is, does your knee feel stable? Do you trust your knee after the onset of pain? That can give us a clue as to whether there's an involvement of the ligaments or the soft tissues that stabilize the knee. Now, the x-rays you see there are representative pictures of how we look at and create arthritis. So most people who are playing pickleball are over the age of 30 in this country. And I'm one of those people. And there's probably some osteophytes or little bone spurs on my x-ray of my knees. I don't want to know about it because I don't want to spend too much time thinking about it. But as we progress down the pathway from grade one to grade four, that's more severe osteoarthritis. Now, just because you have some bone spurs on your x-ray doesn't mean there can't be something wrong with the meniscus or the cartilage, but it does give us a good idea of what's going on in the knee and how long it's been going on. So if it's not your knee that's bothering you, but rather it's your foot or your ankle, again, x-rays will be really important because they can tell us some things about the bone, a little bit about the soft tissue, and they can tell us what it definitely is not. So oftentimes people roll their ankle, whether it's stepping on a ball or changing direct direction quickly, an ankle sprain versus an ankle fracture that FX represents fracture in our parlance. Those are very different injuries. And sometimes an ankle fracture and an ankle sprain can be equivalent in terms of how we treat them. But we want to know whether or not you have a broken bone down around your ankle. The other thing that people hurt down around the ankle and heel can be their Achilles tendon. So the Achilles tendon and the calf muscle are two discrete structures and injuries to those two structures will be managed differently. So the image on the left side of the screen there is an ankle that is probably sprained. The bones are okay. So the little bone on the outside is the fibula. The big bone that's larger in the center is the tibia bone. And one or both of those is often involved in an ankle fracture. Now the image on the right is an ankle fracture where people, the uh, patient has broken both her fibula and her tibia. So that's something that will likely need a surgical fix, whereas most ankle sprains can be managed without surgical treatment. The bottom line is that we can't tell based on bruising if it's a fracture, you'll wanna get an x-ray. And if you can't bear weight, meaning you can't walk on this foot or ankle, come in and get an x-ray and we'll try to get started on a diagnosis. So I mentioned before, an Achilles injury versus a calf strain. So the Achilles tendon is the confluence of the three large muscles in the back of the lower leg. The fancy orthopedic name is the triceps suri. That's the two gastrocnemius muscles, a totally ridiculous name for muscles, but the big calf muscles you can see and feel on your leg are the gastroc muscles. So those can sometimes be strained when you're playing pickleball. Frequently, uh, you'll feel it after 35 or 45 minutes of playing. You get a little bit sore, and then all of a sudden the soreness gets worse high up in the back part of the leg. Now, the Achilles tendon is lower down, closer to the heel, and it's the tendinous attachment of those muscles to bone. When people tear their Achilles tendon, it will often feel like they've been kicked or shot in the back of the leg. People will frequently look behind them to see whether or not someone has kicked them because they have really significant pain at the back of their ankle joint. So an Achilles injury will often require an Achilles tendon repair, not always, but it's often a surgical injury, whereas a calf strain is actually called tennis leg. And maybe in five or 10 years, we'll call it a pickle leg uh, because it's becoming more and more common that people strain the muscle. And a muscle strain is just a, a partial tear of the muscle and can often be treated with a period of rest and return to activity in a gradual fashion. So it's really important to distinguish those two things. So don't wait on it because we'll wanna know how best to treat you. So don't wait weeks and months before you come in because that might change um, the decision-making algorithm. If we go to the elbow, um, there's lateral pain or pain on the outside of the elbow and medial pain, pain on the inside of the elbow, closer to your rib cage. And traditionally, lateral elbow pain has been called tennis elbow, while medial pain is called golf, golfer's elbow. Both will uh, present in pickleball athletes, and both are usually managed with a period of bracing and activity modification. So you come in with severe pain on the inside or outside of your elbow. If all you get is a brace and activity modification, again, it's not because we don't like you or care about you. I think it's fortunate that you're not being offered a surgery for something that will likely resolve on its own. Uh, but I think important to have it evaluated if it doesn't get better with a period of rest and activity modification on your own. Now let's get back to these dormant injuries. 
if you have a rotator cuff tear, so the first line treatment of RC or rotator cuff tear is physical therapy. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 80%, depending on the studies you look at, of patients, so 40 to 80% of patients with a rotator cuff tear can be treated successfully without surgery. Um, now, the specifics of who needs surgery and, and who doesn't need surgery are, you know, they're a lecture in and of themselves. But I think if you have a rotator cuff injury, it's a good bet that you'll probably be treated with a round of physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, and you might get better without ever needing a knife, which is our hope. That's certainly my hope if you come to see me in the office. Now, if you have OA or osteoarthritis, the treatment is sometimes a corticosteroid injection plus or minus physical therapy. The philosophy being that you have wear and tear in the joint, the cartilage is worn away. Sometimes physical therapy can make that wear and tear worse. And I'd rather have you use your shoulder out there on the pickleball court than use up all the good tread in that shoulder doing physical therapy. Now, the key and one of the reasons we get our x-rays, which are not as fancy as expensive, or, you know, they don't show as much detail as an MRI, but they do tell us the difference between rotator cuff arthritis, that right-sided image, and primary osteoarthritis. And that's really important for us to distinguish because those are treated differently. Here we go. So a recent study uh, done this, it's a very hot topic, sort of management of pickleball injuries, was how people did after they had a shoulder replacement, right? The idea of a joint replacement is sort of an existential crisis inducing moment, right? If, you're, if your joint is worn out, what does it mean about you, your ability to participate in sports? Um, well, 90% of patients who had a joint replaced, whether it was with a, an anatomic shoulder orthoplasty, which you see here, where we put the ball back in the ball spot and the socket back in the socket spot, or a reverse shoulder orthoplasty, 90% of those patients got back to activity and were able to return to playing pickleball. And I think the biggest thing that, that we found was that patients had pain prior to surgery. You know, they had this flare up of a dormant injury that caused pain. They were, they were able to push through it and continue with racket sports. But after the shoulder replacement, their pain level dropped significantly. In, in many cases, a zero out of 10. So a shoulder replacement is often the best pain relieving option if you have a flare up of your shoulder injury while playing pickleball. And I think that we're at the summary page because I want to leave a lot of time to answer your questions. So first off, pickleball is good for you and it's good fun. Second, an ounce of prevention is greater than a pound of cure. So it's really important to get out there and get warmed up. Just bouncing up and down on your toes before you get out on the court can wake up your muscles, wake up your balance, and prevent falls and tears as you accelerate quickly to make sure you get those dinks. And the third thing is that injuries happen, and when they do, we're here for you. Most injuries that people sustain while playing pickleball are not career-ending. Um, and we want to get you back out on the court. That's why we go into sports medicine. It's not just for Olympians and professional athletes. We're here for the athlete in all of us. So that concludes a lot of my talking, and I'm really happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Here I am. Oh, that was so interesting. I feel like I learned a lot, right? Um, okay, so I have a few questions here in the chat, and then I have a couple in my email, so we'll just go through those. Um, the first question is, I have arthrodesis of tib tibial tarsal, talon avicular, oh my gosh, this is every hard word, um, multiple joints. I wear a rocker bottom sneaker for pickleball. Any other suggestions or concerns? Yeah, that, that is a great question. Um, I'm glad that you're wearing rocker bottom shoes. Really done, well done there, Kristen. Uh, those are hard words to pronounce. So when you have fused joints in the foot, it puts a little bit more stress on all of the unfused joints or subsequently on the ankle um, and the Achilles tendon. So a rocker bottom sole is, I think, a very good choice. I'm glad you're doing that. I think concerns would be that the lever arm that you're playing through is a little bit longer than somebody who has those joints unfused. But I think I'd let pain be your guide. You know, if, if the pain you're feeling uh, while playing is not different from pain you may have residual when you're not playing, uh, keep going. You know, I, there's no particular warm up that's going to make that better or worse, aside from really just making sure that your um, plantar fascia is not stressed in a huge way when you start. So I think, you know, sort of squeezing a towel with your toes. I know it sounds silly for like a, such a complex question, but really trying to make sure that you're 
working on what we call the wind last mechanism from the Achilles to the plantar fascia. So grabbing a towel, sort of squeezing that under your toes to make sure the muscles in your feet uh, are warmed up and that you have an appropriate stretch of the plantar fascia can be really helpful. Um, otherwise, I think, yeah, again, I'd let pain be your guide. Um, if you have worn an ankle brace before, you can keep doing it, but I wouldn't say that you have to wear one to protect your ankle, but you just want to understand that the, the ankle and Achilles are under a little bit more stress, but I say go for it if you're not having pain. Great. Um, I had a massive rotator cuff tear from colliding with my partner. Surgery in February, and I'm back playing without any problems. Am I at an increased risk of a recurring tear? I'm 76 years old. Yeah. Um, great question. I'm glad you had a fix. So in that 40 to 80% of people who can do well without surgery, the massive rotator cuff tear, uh, those will not do well without surgery because um, they tend to retract. So I'm glad that you had it fixed. Um, I think you are at risk of a, a recurrent tear just because you're using your shoulder. But if you've been cleared for activities and you're not having pain, I think you want to get out and use that. You know, the, if the muscles uh, are, of your rotator cuff are developed appropriately and well balanced, um, and you don't have any residual impingement, um, they, I imagine they did a little bit of a subacromial decompression to take away some bone that was impinging upon your tendons. I don't think you're at a, a huge risk as long as you've been cleared by your treating surgeon. Um, you know, the collision caused the tear, so it's not like it was pure degeneration. I'd say go out, uh, go for it, and use use that shoulder. Awesome. And just going back to the last question, I have someone asking, um, what are rocker bottom shoes? I have pronation. My feet are old, but I'm still looking for a shoe that's good. Yeah. So rocker bottom uh, shoes will sort of allow toe off um, with the rocker of the shoe rather than being sort of very flat on the bottom is a sort of a simplistic way to think about it. I think if you have pronated feet, having a little bit more medial support sort of on the arch side is probably the best answer. Um, you know, rocker bottom shoes are, are all the rage now in the world of distance running. You know, they have these carbon soles with really advanced fancy rockers. But if you have that medial sided support and good grip on the bottom of your shoe, um, I think that's the most important thing. The one thing you may run into with Shoes like, you know, Hoka um, is, is a very popular shoe for runners. I wouldn't recommend wearing those uh, to play pickleball because your stack height or the, the sort of height of the sole is raised. And the more that you're pivoting on high stack shoes, uh, you know, you can imagine if you took it to the extreme, if you were wearing, you know, five inch heels, you're at more of a risk uh, to sprain your ankle or break your ankle. So I, I think any shoes that you'd wear for tennis and are sold as tennis shoes are, are appropriate for pickleball. Um, and sometimes inserts can be helpful rather than changing your shoe if you have pronation issues. Great. Um, I am 75 with osteoporosis and osteoarthritis. I should do warm ups. My left knee has been x rayed and MRI. I still basically limp when walking and I still play sometimes the knee buckles when walking. Uh, I was told there's still space, um, so no replacement. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, that's good news that you're, you know, you still have space, um, you know, that your arthritis is not end stage. The, the buckling while walking um, can be coming from two places uh, in the knee and an extrinsic place outside the knee. So it could be that there's a meniscus tear that's, you know, been there for a long time um, or has developed, you know, over sort of weeks and months. And sometimes the catching of that meniscus uh, can lead to buckling. Sometimes it can be cartilage as a, a flap of cartilage is sort of taken off by a shearing moment at the knee that can cause your knee to buckle. Um, I'd say you just want to be careful if, if you have true buckling events while walking, um, you don't want that to happen while you're, you're running or changing directions. If the adrenaline of playing pickleball makes it disappear, then I'd say, you know, get, get amped up and, and don't have the knee buckle. Um, the, the concern is always those mechanical moments. You know, knee arthroscopy is not a good treatment for arthritis. So having your knee scoped and cleaned up is not a good answer. And in most cases, unless you do have mechanical symptoms. So if your knee is buckling because of painful catching, um, then it'd be a good idea to see somebody. But otherwise, I think getting warmed up and, and playing is fine. Um, if you do still have joint space, then there's no need to rush to a knee replacement. Great. Um, I have a really interesting question down here. Hello, I'm a pickleball instructor and my wife is an orthopedic surgeon. We often discuss how pickleball brings non-athletes into intense physical activity who are more at risk for unusual injuries. Just like last week, I had a student tear their anterior, anterior 
tibialis tendon, obviously an uncommon injury. What can I do as a pickleball instructor to best prepare my students who have no athletic background or predisposition and might be vulnerable to low probability, highly disruptive injuries? I love that question. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, I think when you're, you know, in, in that position, you want to have a little bit more of an intense warm up. If these are folks who are maybe a little bit younger, non-athletes doing this physical activity, you know, having them do, you know, the sort of calisthenic warm up that you might do for high school athletes of, you know, making sure that they can flex their hips up, up to their chest. Um, you know, if someone has balance issues, obviously you don't want to do that, but really work on those hip flexion moments, have them do sort of toe taps. So stationary toe taps, it seems silly, but it activates the tibialis anterior and the posterior chain as you're tapping. Um, so I think focusing more on the warm up for those people, it's, it seems tedious because people come to the court to play pickleball or play tennis or whatever it is. But I think doing a little bit more of sort of the plyometric warm up, whatever you feel comfortable instructing could be really nice. Um, because as you pointed out, when people haven't been using these muscles for 25, 30, 40 years plus, um, they're at, they're at more risk for injuring those structures, but really it's, it's just about trying to get the blood flowing. Um, and when you're instructing, I would, you know, try to keep people from having those big chase moments, um, from, you know, side to side or front to back, you know, big, long back pedals or sprints, uh, predisposed people. So starting with the building blocks and, and going from there. Um, let's talk about lower back injuries. Yeah. Um, so I was talking with one of my colleagues in the office today about this and he said, pickleball injuries tend to be axial low back pain. That's been his experience. Um, so when people are sort of bent forward at the, the lumbar spine, rather than having lordosis, we have what we call kyphosis. So that axial midline low back pain um, is pretty common with pickleball. And for that, I think trying to strengthen your core is the best thing you can do. So that can be done with sort of planks, um, whether that's on an extended elbow on your, you know, having your hand flat on the ground or done with your elbows flexed to 90 degrees and you're on the ground doing that plank, um, laying on your back and doing straight leg lifts can help to strengthen your core. Um, I think those are the, the big things you can do because I know that I'm definitely guilty of it, that I don't like to do core exercises, but I love to run around. Um, and then I feel sore afterwards. So if it's a, it's a midline sort of low back pain, the best way to treat that is with physical therapy, you know, maybe an x-ray to evaluate, see if there's anything, um, sort of acute in the low back, but physical therapy with core strengthening exercises, are, are the best bet. Now, if you have radiating pain, shooting down one leg or both legs or weakness or something like that, then a little bit more urgent. And we think about an MRI there, uh, but core exercises are going to be the key. They're tedious and they don't always lead to six pack abs, but they're definitely worthwhile. Um, at what point would a shoulder replacement be recommended? Yeah. So in the world of orthopedics, shoulder replacement is one of uh, the favorite options of the surgeon. I, I, I love shoulder replacements because patients tend to be really happy afterwards if you are sort of doing it right and you let the patient decide. So if you are having pain at night, so pain that wakes you up at night, if you have pain with range of motion doing everyday activities, and if you have pain that's keeping you from playing pickleball, I think those are all good options. Um, shoulder replacement's not a good option if you have, you know, rotator cuff tendonitis or tendonitis of the biceps. Um, sometimes physical therapy or arthroscopic treatment is a good answer there. Um, but if you're having really significant pain and you have evidence of significant arthritis on x-ray, I think it's a reasonable option. I would try steroid injections first as a, you know, a, a not, not so old man, but not so young man anymore. I've had two injections in my right shoulder, my dominant shoulder, and that's been great for the last 10 years. Um, so I think injections are a good first option, as long as you can tolerate corticosteroids. But after that, if your shoulder is preventing you from doing the things you want to do in life, a shoulder replacement, either of the anatomic or reverse variety is a great pain relieving, uh, surgery, particularly the reverse shoulder replacement. Um, and I can talk more about that if, if folks have questions. Hey, um, I have two similar questions here. Um, Looking for supports or braces for tennis elbow and also golfer's elbow. Yeah, great, great question. So I think the first is to think about why these things happen. So tennis elbow is a lateral epicondylitis, um, which is from sort of stress on the tendons that bring your wrist back into a cocked position. It's almost like a backhand um, elbow. You know, it's a backhand motion that causes the strain. To treat that, you can often 
have, get a cock up wrist splint. You know, they look sort of like the rollerblading splints that folks had uh, in the 80s and 90s or a carpal tunnel splint. So if you hold your wrist in extension and you don't have to work to do that because you have a brace on while you're at work or, you know, sort of hanging out at night, that kind of brace can be really nice to rest those extensor tendons. Um, so that's useful for tennis elbow. You also um, will see straps that put compression just past the elbow, just distal to the elbow in the forearm. And that can be really nice because it shortens the effective length of the tendon. Um, so, um, you know, may, some of you may have seen the Chopat braces that people wear for the patellar tendon. It looks just like almost like a, you know, a, a, a bracelet around the wrist or the knee. And that compression can you know, relieve symptoms. If it's lateral epicondylitis, you have that compression brace on the outside. If it's golfer's elbow or medial epicondylitis, same story, having a brace there uh, can be helpful. And oral anti-inflammatories are often uh, the most helpful thing, whether that's ibuprofen, Aleve, naproxen, or something prescription like meloxicam or diclofenac, those can be really helpful. Great. Um, is it risky to backpedal? When it is playing? risky. Yeah. Um, so backpedaling requires, um, you know, pretty significant coordination, especially if you're looking up. So you can imagine if you're looking up for a ball overhead, backpedaling um, can be a challenge because all of your balance is headed backwards. It's a good idea if if you have any concerns about it to make that a part of your warm up. So you can, you know, sort of backpedal from the net uh, back to the baseline, slide laterally to the other side of the court, whether it's left or the right, and then do a little sprint towards the net. Just doing that uh, sort of square exercise can be helpful. But if you want, if you're going to backpedal, which inevitably you will as a reaction to a, an opponent's shot, you want to make sure you have your knees bent. So straight leg backpedaling where you're slamming your heels into the ground is um, a less balanced backpedal than if you have your knees bent and your hips low like an athlete and you're using the balls of your feet. Great. Um, thoughts on how to prevent plantar fasciitis um, and I guess thoughts on the Vionic brand of shoes. Gotcha. I wish I knew more about bionic shoes. There was a period in my life when I knew everything there was to know about uh, sneakers. Um, but that was a period where I spent money on sneakers and I, and I was 19. Um, I think preventing plantar fasciitis, the big thing to do is to just try to strengthen your feet. So the grabbing of the sort of, if you have um, a, a clean dish rag or a, an old uh, towel that you might use on your face in the bathroom or a hand towel, taking that and putting it underneath the, the balls of your feet and sort of scrunching your toes and bringing that flat towel into a sort of uh, compressed towel underneath your toes can be really, really helpful. Um, it's not a quick fix and it can often be pretty annoying to do. Um, so I think if you um, can sort of pull the towel in, that can be helpful doing just calf raises where you are doing, you know, the fancy term on all orthopedic textbooks and exams is sort of eccentric exercises around the calves. That can be helpful. Um, and orthotics can sometimes be a good option. Um, so I, I, I would, I would think about all those things. Great. Um, I have osteoarthritis in my knees with little cartilage and it hurts playing out after playing. Um, is there a way to regrow cartilage? Oh, man, if we could do it, we could retire we would be able to, to get out of here. So there are some treatments for uh, local cartilage damage in uh, people who are younger than I am. Um, but when there's sort of a number of cartilage lesions, that, you know, all throughout the knee and, and it's gotten to the point where it is truly osteoarthritis, there's no way to regrow it. There are some options. People will talk about PRP or stem cell injections or BMAC, bone marrow, aspirate concentrate. None of those things regrow cartilage. Sometimes they can help with inflammation and pain. But at this point, uh, we can't make it regrow. Um, if we could do it, we put our total knee doctors out of business and we could retire to the Caribbean or wherever you want to go. Do you have any exercises that you recommend for balance? Yeah. So I think simply doing things that require balance um, are, are good exercises. Um, something that I picked up from an, an older surgeon who I really admired was that uh, when he goes to, to put his shoes on, he will stand on one leg and uh, tie the other shoe. Now, if you really have trouble with balance, you don't want to try this, but forcing yourself to use your balance uh, throughout the activities you do every day. So if you put on, uh, you know, your left shoe, you stand on your right and you lift it up and have to tie it instead of, you know, balancing or sitting down um, single leg activity. So if you're standing on a single leg, you can 
you know, lift your leg up off the ground. Uh, you know, say you're standing on your right leg, lift your leg, left leg off the ground until you feel comfortable. You can do that for 10 or 15 seconds. Then you can advance to lifting your left leg all the way up to a nine degree angle, um, sort of out in front of you and hold that for 10 or 15 seconds. Um, doing that can be really helpful. And then trying to work on that with closed eyes. Obviously you don't want to go straight to, you know, you know, standing on one leg with your eyes closed if you're concerned about your balance in a serious way. Um, but working on activities that really recruit uh, sort of the, the neurons of the, the posterior aspect of your spinal cord can be really helpful. So stand on one leg and close your eyes just for a little bit of time every day yeah. can help with our balance. Gravity is yeah. the biggest enemy. Yeah, maybe like when you're brushing your teeth, I see like you could, you know, be brushing your teeth and then you're doing more than one thing and you're also standing on one leg. There yes. You go. Yeah. I walk and chew gum, but no, I think that that is a really good one. Just build it into to other things that you're doing every day. Um, with a likely old medial meniscal tear that has flared up since starting to play pickleball, any general recommendations for regarding frequency of play? Don't play two days in a row, max three times per week. What do you think? Yeah, um, I think a lot of it will be how your symptoms uh, sort of flare up and, and what you can do. I think you don't want to push it to the point where you can't recover. You know, if you don't want to play three days in a row and say, oh my gosh, this is terrible, and then miss two weeks. Uh, I think giving yourself time to recover is really important. That's that's why a lot of uh, professional athletes are able to play longer uh, than they have in, in, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, you get guys in the NFL and NBA are playing into their late thirties and early forties, uh, because of the rest that they're, they're allowed by their schedule. Um, so if you are playing two days in a row and that causes pain, I would say then just, you know, always give yourself a day of recovery. Um, but I would let pain be your guide. It's hard to give very specific recommendations um, other than don't play when your knee is swollen. And if you find that you're swelling more frequently, even without pain, then you want to tone it down too, because that's a sign there's something going on in your knee. Elbow injuries, elbow tendonitis, what do you do and how, what should you do to prepare for a game? Yeah. So somebody, I, I saw somebody bring it up in the chat earlier. Sometimes you can um, get a low vibration racket or a, or a lighter racket um, just as, as a sort of broad step to help address elbow tendonitis, you know, heavier rackets, rackets that bring more vibration in your hand are going to put more stress on uh, these tendons. So think about your racket choice. It doesn't have to be the most expensive racket or the one um, that your, your, your best friend has. So something lighter can be easier on those tendons. Then otherwise it's, it's doing exercises you know, just sort of like an extended arm. I don't know if you guys can see my video. I hope, I hope the folks can, um, although I'm looking pretty pale tonight, but just, you know, sort of extending your wrist to stretch it, flexing your wrist. That's how you stretch those tendons. Um, so those are really the two big things. Um, sometimes a little gentle massage beforehand um, can help with the, the sensation of tightness, but there's no magic other than trying to strengthen those tendons and increase their flexibility. Um, I know you just mentioned the um, vibrating paddles. So do you think that they're worth it? There's just a question um, that there are some paddles that claim to be good at absorbing vibration. So they're wondering, are they actually worth it? I, I think that they are. You know, I haven't had the, the personal experience of, you know, the, the vibration causing problems and switching to a lower vibration racket. Um, but I think if you've tried other things uh, and it's, they're not working for you, if you've tried a little bit of stretching, a little bit anti-inflammatories, icing after you play. If that stuff doesn't help, then I think it's very reasonable to to change the equipment um, and and see if that helps you. I, I don't think any racket's going to be uh, a, or paddle is going to be a panacea for for a racket sport player, whether tennis or or pickleball. So it's got to be some intrinsic to you and some of the equipment change. Um, and just to go back a little bit, um, as we were talking about tennis and golfer's elbow, what actually causes that? Um, is it coming from the tendons in the elbow or maybe the wrist? Why, why do we get those things? Yeah, it's coming from their sort of tendon origin at the elbow. So it's just that, you know, the, the wrist is, is where those muscles act. So it's the tendons at the elbow that get irritated. Um, it's when you look at these in the operating room, because occasionally they don't respond to conservative therapy and you need to clean up the tendon surgically in order for the pain to go away. Um, if you look at it, it doesn't look like healthy sort of bright white tendon, like the, the rest of the elbow. Um, it looks sort of degenerated. So, um, it's just small tears, fluid gets into the small tears and they don't heal. Uh, so the, the best thing you can do is strengthen the entire area. You know, if, if the rest of the tendons are strong, um, then, and the muscles are strong, you have a better chance of doing okay. Um, I'll play pickleball with a woman with a frozen shoulder. She's been told to continue to play uh, to keep the shoulder moving. Is this the best advice? 
if she truly has a frozen shoulder, then it's okay uh, to try to play. And it, it sort of depends on where she at, where she's, uh, where she is along the spectrum of, of frozen shoulder treatment. So adhesive capsulitis is the fancy term for it. Um, it often comes about after a small injury and then it, the, the shoulder joint gets irritated and, and is painful with motion. Keeping a frozen shoulder moving is, is part of the treatment, but so is formal physical therapy, oral anti-inflammatories, and sometimes steroids. Um, so I would say that, you know, as someone, I had a frozen shoulder when I was about 24 years old, um, and it was incredibly painful to do athletic activities, like, like actually playing basketball was hard. Um, so if, if playing tennis hurts I, or playing pickleball hurts, pardon me, I wouldn't do it. Um, but keeping the shoulder moving, if it is frozen shoulder is the right answer, but you just kind of have to let pain be the guide. Um, I just want to make sure I get to the questions in my email. So um, I am a 75-year-old male with a history of osteoarthritis of the knee. I gave up tennis about 10 years ago, but started pickleball a year ago and love the game. I usually suffer knee pain after playing. Icing doesn't help. Uh, topical Voltaren gel 1% provides some relief. Any other suggestions? So topical helps. Um I, I missed I missed the beginning part. I was trying to scroll to find the question. So, oh yeah. no, it's a, it, this one's in my email. Sorry. Oh, gotcha. No, it's okay. It's okay. I just wanted to make sure that I, I answered the first part. There's a former is... uh, tennis player been playing pickleball for a year. They stopped playing yeah. tennis about ten years. Been playing pickleball for a year using Voltaren for knee pain. Yeah. So I think the topical Voltaren is great. Um, systemic anti-inflammatories can also be helpful. Um, and sometimes the prescription stuff uh, is more helpful than ibuprofen. Meloxicam is, is my go-to. It's, I think it's like the least expensive prescription. You only have to take it once a day, um, but it's very similar to Voltaren or Diclofenac gel, but sometimes uh, the gel doesn't penetrate deep into the joint. So sometimes systemic anti-inflammatories are the answer. Okay. And a follow-up to that question, he said, um, can he do harm by playing pickleball with osteoarthritis of the knee? No, I, I, when you have osteoarthritis, the activities that you do, as long as they're not extreme, you know, I wouldn't recommend like, you know, jumping from height and landing on your knees, but otherwise, um, arthritis, some people are more prone to it. Sometimes old injuries lead to it, but activity hasn't been shown to, you know, make it worse while rest makes it better. Um, so you want to use up those knees. We don't want to arrive at the pearly gates with perfectly pristine joints. Um, I think I would use it if it's something you love. And as long as you can tolerate the discomfort, go for it. Uh, a couple more. Um, I thought you had to wear cork shoes for pickleball. What rocker bottom shoes can you wear for pickle pickleball? I have plantar fasciitis and got pickleball shoes, but my feet are killing me after. Yeah. And this, this goes with the next question about running or walking yep. shoes, flat bottom court shoes. So those, those are the best answer. Um, for people, if you haven't had a, a multiple joint fusion in your foot, I would go away from the rocker bottom. The rocker bottom shoes mentioned earlier are more for if you've had a, you know, the, the fusion that was described is pretty significant. So I would stay away from that if you, um, if you don't have a fused midfoot, hindfoot, forefoot, any of that stuff. Um, I think we, we see patients with plantar fasciitis. We see patients with Achilles strains, Achilles tears, calf strains. I think that the question is sort of where your foot hurts. If your shoes are too narrow, um, I know that for me, that's been an issue. I pride myself on being an athlete, but I, I have a little wider feet uh, than might be considered cool. So I wear wider shoes. So thinking about the shoe width and any inserts you can get can be really helpful. Um, so I, I, I think you wanna wear court shoes. You don't want to wear running shoes. You don't want to wear, um, you know, stuff with a big stack. So think about orthotics um, and strengthening the plantar fascia would, would be the big things. Um, yeah. I think that you hit that answer there. Um, I just had a total knee replacement a month ago. When can I go back? I'm going crazy. Signed, pickleball addict. Oh, pickleball addict. Uh, I would, I would defer to your treating, to treating surgeon. Um, I think it will take a little bit of time. Um, I'm glad that you're out of the first six days and of uh, total knee replacement. I know it can be really uncomfortable to have your knee replaced. Um, but as you progress back into, um, you know, a little bit more aerobic activity and strengthening, then you can get back on the court. You want to make sure you're, you're strong enough to be out there because a fracture around a total knee replacement is no bueno. It's not a, not a good thing, not something that we want to have. So um, I think patience, uh, pickleball addict, and I, I wish you the best in your recovery, um, so you can really enjoy it when you're back. 
And to, to piggyback on that, does um, uh, I had a knee replacement about eight years ago. Is it is pickleball going to make it wear out faster? Uh, yes and no. Um, our new generation of implants in the knee are sort of highly cross-linked polyethylene rather than standard polyethylene as the liner in the, the knee joint um, has been these highly cross-linked uh, plastics are, they have better wear patterns. They're more durable than, than in, in the past. I would say that if you enjoy pickleball, I wouldn't stop playing uh, because of fear that uh, your, your total knee will wear out faster. Now, that being said, I wouldn't decide that now you want to run uh, 10Ks and half marathons and marathons. You know, the, the consistent pounding of thousands and thousands of steps of running um, does wear out the components faster. But I think it's very reasonable uh, to continue playing because it's, it's something that is good for you in all those other ways, you know, it decreases, you know, risk of bad outcomes with respiratory disease, decreases the risk of cancer, makes you feel better and you get to enjoy time with friends. So I say, go for it. Um, Molly Deasy. I have strained the muscle or ligament in the top front of both legs where they meet my torso. What can I do to help with the discomfort and how can I try to prevent this from happening again? Um, you know, I think you want to identify whether or not this is truly a strained muscle or ligament, or if it's, um, you know, pain come from the hip joint itself. So sometimes groin pain, right at, you know, sort of where your legs are meeting your torso pain up in, in the front there can sometimes be a pain that's coming from the hips. Oftentimes we think of hip pain as being lateral sort of out on the side. And that's not, not really where the intraarticular or in the joint stuff happens. So you want to make sure it's not, um, anything going on in the hip joint. And then otherwise stretching can be really helpful. It can be uncomfortable to do, you know, hyperlordotic or back extension uh, poses, but you want to get a good stretch in. Um, and I would, you know, keep an eye on whether it's more on one side or the other. If it's, if it's both sides that feel strained, um, I think stretching is good. If one side is more symptomatic than the other, it's more likely to be a, uh, a hip pr problem or a muscle problem. Great. Do you know Molly Deasy? I do. She's, she can call me anytime. She's been featured in the picture. Uh, yeah. That's what I thought. <laughs> I was like, wait, it's easy. Yeah. Um, I am in PT for tennis elbow and torn tendon. I had an MRI. Should I stop playing until I have no pain? Um, some of that depends on, on the type of tendon tear. So without the specifics of the tendon tear, it's hard to say. Radiologists, their job is to describe uh, what they see on imaging rather than being uh, able to truly sort of diagnose and provide treatment plans for patients. So partial tearing of an extensor tendon or the common extensor origin or something like that seen on MRI is common uh, for folks who have tennis elbow diagnoses and an MRI. Um, I think you want to gradually return. You don't want to play if it's causing you pain. Ideally, if you could wait until you didn't have pain, that would be great. But if that takes, you know, six months, a year, two years, uh, we don't want to get uh, to the point where you're not playing at all and, and you're, you know, losing fitness and losing fun because of it. So, you know, I would talk to whoever ordered the MRI um, and see what they think based on your physical exam and the other things going on in your arm, because a partially torn tendon is something you're going to see in, in a lot of people who have tennis elbow. Great. Um, have you noticed that any paddles are any better or worse for reducing the risk of tennis elbow? What matters more for controlling that risk, the weight type or the stroke slash form? I think uh, stroke and form um, and the patient's general or the, you know, the player's general health and strength in the upper extremity are more important. And then lighter paddles are lower risk. I don't have a particular uh, paddle that I recommend, but I think a lighter paddle and, you know, improved form are, are better as well as uh, folks who have sort of stronger form muscles for extension and flexion of the wrists uh, at, when they go into playing the game. Um, is there a limit on how many cortisone shots you can get to the same joint, in particular the knee? Um, that's sort of up to a provider. Um, there are some folks who get their, you know, corticosteroid injections in their knee every three to six months for years and years. There's no set limit on how many times you can do it before things, you know, before it stops working. A lot of it is a, a sort of rule of diminishing marginal returns with each cortisone shot. We tend to find, and you got to know that there are exceptions to this, that each time you give a cortisone injection, um, patients will tend to get a little bit less duration of relief. And that's not always true. 
but you don't want to keep doing it if it's not helping. You know, if you get a year's worth of relief, that's great, or six months or four months. But if you're getting two, three, four weeks of relief, I think you want to consider another option at that point. But you shouldn't get them too close together. Um, so you, I, I wouldn't do it uh, more than sort of once every three months. Great. And our last question, I had a total hip replacement in 2011. I've been playing pickleball for about five years. It is, is it going to make the hip replacement wear out sooner? So similar to the question about the knee replacement. Yeah, I, in, you know, prosthetic joint replacement, um, any use of the joint makes it wear out a little bit faster. You know, they're sort of micro aware of the plastic particles against the metal components. Uh, but 2011 is a sort of relatively modern generation of, of total hip. It obviously depends on uh, where you had your surgery done and what implants they put in. But I think, you know, pickleball will increase the wear, but walking causes it to wear too, going up and down steps, doing the things you do in life. So if you're not having uh, symptomatic pain or squeaking or any sort of other signs and symptoms, I'd say keep going and you want to use it up. Awesome. That was all the questions. But you know what? Let me just check my email again really quick. I think we got everybody's questions. Yeah, I don't have any more. I don't have any more in here. So thank you so much. That was really interesting. I feel like I learned uh, learned a really a lot. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and just to everyone, this is been this has been recorded. Um, it takes us a, a few days to get it up on YouTube, but then you'll get an email coming from Zoom with the link, so you can review it, share it with your friends. Um, and I put my phone number and my email in the chat. You can schedule um, appointments with Dr. Deasy. If you have any further questions, you can reach out to me and I'll get them to him. Um, I forgot to mention this in the beginning. He does see patients in our Princeton and our Bordentown offices. Um, lots of availability. We'd love to see if you have any injuries. Hopefully you don't. Um, and then I'll let Dr. Deasy say goodnight too. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, for attending. I'm, I feel honored that I get to, to speak with all of you. If you have questions or you need to come in for a visit, as Kristen said, always happy to see you. Um, and I hope you get to uh, continue to enjoy a wonderful game with friends and family. So have a great night. All right. Good night.